Welcome back, champs. Today, we're going to go through graph interpretation in time. You can see I've changed a bit just because I'm re-recording this. Essentially, I look back and the explanation for this part of the course was pretty lackluster. So I'm coming back and I'm going to try and give you as much value as possible here. So getting into graph interpretation, look, you're going to see that some of the questions, they can be overly complicated. They're going to look very complex. There's going to be a lot of things going on, a lot of numbers everywhere. But rest assured, they will give you everything that you need to understand these graphs. Whether that be in the form of a formula that they give you or an example that they give you to show how these formulas are used in order to work out whatever from the graph, they give you ample information to be able to solve the questions. Otherwise, it would just be way too unfair. Now, with that being said, this does mean that these questions can sap up quite a bit of time. Because simply put, there are quite a bit of barriers to understanding when it comes to interpreting the graph. Depends on the topic, but for example, if there's a question on tax, for example, let's just say we have no idea how tax works. I don't think the UK would expect us to know how tax works, but what they would expect us to know is how to apply a formula. So what they would do is perhaps give you a formula to work with and then see how you can apply it to the graph they've given to you. And maybe they'll give you an example in there to help you out as well, perhaps. So my tip here would be to slow down. Understand what you have to work with first and then approach the question. It really is a game of, or rather the story of the tortoise and the hare, where with these more complicated questions, slowing down, orienting yourself first, makes the approach to the question even quicker than perhaps just rushing through the question being a bit lost, being a bit frantic and having no idea where to go from there. Fundamentally, I believe that in QR, there are two things you can do, interpretation and calculation. This is the two-step process to any quantitative reasoning question. Now, it actually must go in that order because the first step to calculating your answer has to be understanding what on earth you need to calculate in the first place. If you don't know what you're working with, if you don't know what you're calculating, if you can't interpret the question, then what are you calculating? Is it, there was a point in time in my, I suppose, my career as a UCAT, a test taker, where I was doing a lot of calculations and I was getting a lot of questions wrong. I was quick at QR. I was quick. And I, I like to think that I was quite accurate as well, but I was getting a lot of questions wrong. So clearly I wasn't as accurate as I thought I was. But the reason was, is upon reflections, because the questions, I thought I was solving for something completely different. The question would say solve for this, whereas I kind of read solve for another thing. And there were times where I would waste a lot of time, but where I would read the question correctly, but then I'd, I'd have no idea where to go from there. So for example, if we have a graph in front of us, or maybe even multiple graphs, and you got a question, I know the the instinctual thing is to just go, okay, let's read the question and then see where to go from there. I think that's a fine approach when it comes to the more simple questions, but when it's complex when there's multiple graphs going on or the graph is just really weird and you've never seen something like it before, then it pays to actually understand what's going on here so that you can contextualize the question. Because think about it. If you do read the question first and you have no idea what's going on, then you're basically going to have to do this anyways. You're going to have to try and figure out what's going on in the graph so that you can get to the question. Why this is important is because knowing, say, what every single column is talking about, what every single graph is mentioning in terms of its numbers, knowing what the fine print, so like the little sentences down below, what they're saying, because sometimes they can contain quite valuable information. Knowing what they say can make the difference to you understanding the question and actually having a plan of attack so that you can get to calculating as quick as possible or just simply being lost and having no idea what to do. So remember, always pays to interpret before you calculate. Now, moving on to working with time, which is a completely separate topic, but I'm lumping it together with this video because why not? It's really important to know how to work with time and the calculator. So your magic number here is 60. This is how you convert between minutes and seconds. And it's good to know this because calculators work in the decimal system using the number 100. So essentially, 100 units of 0 0.01 will give you 1. We all know that. 
time works in the decimal system, kind of, using 60. I don't know if it's a decimal system, but just, let's just say it is, right? For the example, is it's that 60 units of one minute equals one hour. Again, we all know that. But when it comes to working with that in the calculator, it can get a tad confusing and you, it's easy to get lost, essentially. So when it comes to interpreting what's in the calculator, right? Let's just say you're doing a question and you ended up getting 1,450 minutes as your answer, but the answer options are in hours and minutes. So you know you're going to have to convert this number into hours. So we know that 60 units of one minute is equal to one hour. So you would divide by 60. That gives you 24.166 hours. The mistake here would be to interpret this as 24 hours and 17 minutes. You know, rounding this up to two decimal places. But in reality, it's not. What this is, is 24 hours and then an additional 0.166 of an hour. So if we want to get that value in minutes, what we can do is get this hour value multiplied by 60 to get our minute value, which in this case would give us 10. Therefore, our answer would be 24 hours and 10 minutes. So let's try and put that into practice. Made a little example here. Takes a man 35 minutes to plant 27 trees in his field. How many, how much time in total would it take for him to plant 466 trees around at the nearest minute? Feel free to pause the video now and have a go at this question. Righty, so let's go through this question together. Let's pull up our calculator so that we can calculate this question. So if it takes this man 35 minutes to plant 27 trees and we want to see how much time it takes to plant 466, then what we do first of all is figure out, okay, how many groups of 27 does this man plant? So 466 divided by 27. This is how many groups of 27 this, this guy plants. So this gives us 17.26, okay? Right, so this number is equivalent to this, but that's not our answer. Because again, it's important to note what's in the calculator at all times. This is the groups of 27 this guy's gonna plant, right? So if we multiply that by 35 minutes that it takes to plant these 27 trees, then we get the actual number of minutes it would take to plant the whole thing. So if we multiply this by 35, it gives us 604.07, 604.07. Again, it's important to note what's in the calculator. It's not hours and minutes yet. This is just the raw number of minutes that we're working with. So we know that our answer has to be in the hours and minutes format. So let's convert this into something we can work with. How do we convert from minutes to hours? We divide by that magic number, 60 giving us 10.0679 hours, okay? Now, from here, the mistake would be to pick option C and move on, because now, hopefully, we can see that this is 10 hours and 0 0.0679 of an hour, not seven minutes. So, in order to find out what that actually is, what we can do is go 0.06. 7, 9 times 60, giving us 4, which means that that is actually equivalent to 10 hours and 4 minutes. Hence, my D is our answer.